Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Willis Show. Today with me, Ari Teller. Now, Ari is the San Francisco-based entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of the Smart Nutrition Service, Elo. Elo uses AI personalization engine to turn food from a cause of disease to your best medicine. Ari is also an active angel investor and advisor with a portfolio of 50 startups, including Virtua Health, Verge Motorcycles. I'll check them out. They're very, very cool. They're electric motorcycles. There's a Californian version, by the way, which is where Ari lives, and also uh, Levels and Aura. And I'm actually wearing an Aura ring today. So obviously, uh, Ari's made a little bit of money out of me because I've increased the stock price by one ring. So that's good. Essentially, um, previously, he was the CEO of Quest Analytics, the market leader in doctor data and network management. Ari led the company through a pivotal growth stage from 15 million to 40 million in revenue. Before joining Quest Analytics, Ari was the co-founder and CEO of Better Doctor, a doctor search engine, and Better Doctor raised 30 million from first tier investors, including Nia and Uncork Capital. In June, 2018, Better Doctor was acquired by private equity firm, Vesta Capital. Before Better Doctor, Ari led Nokia's game and application studios after years of family health struggles, Ari has dedicated his life to helping build companies that help people live better. His companies, Better Doctor, Quest Analytics, and Elo, have helped over 100 million people gain better access to health care. When not working or parenting, he has two young children with his wife. Ari spends his time on steep cliffs, powdery slopes, and big cold waves that only Northern California can often. Welcome to the show, Ari. It's a pleasure to be here. Hey, thank you. Great to be here. So, Ari, you um, originally were born and grew up in Finland, and you uh, and I noticed at the beginning of your you know, bio that you were very much involved in uh, online gaming. Where did so obviously you had an in, interest in tech. Where did that interest in technology come? And then I wanted to ask. How did you get into the entrepreneur game? I'd like to hear a little bit about how that all happened to give us some context. Yeah, happy to happy to go there. So I was one of those kids that uh, was very lucky to get access to, to a computer at a very young age. So I think I was probably less than six, seven years old when my, my dad gave his first computer to me to play with. And this is one of the... 086 PCs in 80s where you have this not the small floppy disk but the, the big one that you can kind of use yeah. as a pizza tray and um, and that was funky and you know you couldn't do much with them you could maybe you know use um, some sort of a accounting software and maybe you could draw some stuff and there barely were any games even so I was like playing with those and you know trying to do stuff and then <laughs> got into you know playing the games when they finally came in and you know building like very simple games with with CV Basic, one of the early languages that you can program the, the stuff. And, you know, anyway, that was like my entry. And uh, I got very intrigued about the whole world. And I was the only kid, you know, you, who had a computer. Nobody, I mean, there was no consoles. There was no Commodore 64, no Amiga, anything like that at, at the time. And then, of course, a lot of my friends, they they were kind of like wondering, like, what is this thing that this guy is playing with? And um, and then, you know, we I kind of, there was this group of people that started to kind of hang out together and, you know, got excited about this new idea that, you know, what can you do with the computer? And then, of course, what happened when I went to high school, uh, we had a very progressive uh, school that was connected to the web. They were linked to one university nearby, and we were able to get access to like 94 time frame to the internet. And this was the world, you know, that was no websites. Websites were not invented yet. I mean, email was barely coming together there was no emails yet so it's like this you know like downloading with ftp and uh talking to people in irsc and and of course you know gamers they they love new stuff so there was a group of people who built games and i was i became one of the first people in the world to play the first online games invented we had maybe i don't know fifty thousand hundred thousand people in the world who accessed these and these were kind of the early hackers and and um, it was really cool to be one of the people who, who got there in the like very beginning and i got i got very addicted to the games and i mean within the four or five year period i think i played a third of my time on those games and 
<laughs> I wasn't really. I was very tired when I went to school because I had played until like four in the morning every every night. That sounds and, like that uh, sounds like young people today with sounds like young people today with smartphones, really. Yeah, I mean, I think so a little bit, but you know, the, the difference was that you know this is something that nobody really understood. And then uh, I think the funniest thing that happened to me was that I I got really good at it. I got to be one of the best players in the world, not because of I was so good, but I I was hanging out with people who were really really good. And um, and it's so funny that you know one of my my best friends in the game a long time ago, uh, people always ask me because I've been working in the video games for a long time. Like, should I let my kids play? Are games gonna lead anything good? And I always tell people that you know my my buddy who played the games a long time, he's now the CTO of Goldman Sachs, for example. That's a pretty right. good position to be, you know, one of the biggest companies in the world, you know, maybe the most, one of the most impactful people in tech today. And, you know, he, he spent more time than I did on playing the games. And um, so sometimes, you know, it can pay off. And yeah. uh, But that's, for me, it was like really interesting kind of growing up period because I was the youngest guy. I was more like a high schooler. Other people were in college, maybe graduated uh, a few years older. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned, you know, how to kind of lead, you know, a group of people. I learned how to, you know, build games in the end. And I, I learned a lot about the tech. So that was a really foundational time for me. Uh, I don't know if I learned much in high school, but at, at least I learned a lot on, on the games. Yeah, well, I think, you know, gaming got a bad name because it looks like people are addicted. And they are. Uh, but it can teach... Um, but some fascinating thing about gaming now is that even Formula One drivers, and they've even introduced and brought people in to run, you know, even race proper race cars, and found that those who've done been really good at gaming, as in racing gaming, are uh, have incredible skills, and it's taught virtually rather than actually uh, by crashing a car regularly. So um, it's pretty cool. So the thing I'm curious about with all of my guests is that. You then went to university and did a degree in in Finland. What? Why did you choose the topics and subject area that you chose at was like Vassa University? Yeah, I went to um, university uh, in Finland. The one unique thing that uh, might many people might not know is that uh, you have a mandatory military service, so you go for about a year. So usually when you graduate high school, often people take, you don't have to do it then, but most people take it after that. And you go uh, to, to run around the forest and sit with different kind of guns for one year. And then you go to university. So I already had a had an access to, to the school before I went to army. So you kind of had like a year. And then I extended that time a little bit. And I, I went, to, went to work in London. Uh, I was like 19 and, and went to work as a barman. In, uh, in London and that was a really cool time to be like you know first time you go to army alone and then you go to you know London to hang out there for you know six months or whatever and that then you go to study so it's kind of interesting experience to do that and I went to went to study uh, business and, and and computer science so I wanted to kind of uh, follow both and Finland is one of those unique countries um, like Nordic countries overall that you can get uh, to study for free so you don't pay anything for for the studying. So you can pretty much study. And like I did, I was studying two masters at the same time. So I, I was enrolled in two different you know, schools. And um, that would be very difficult to do in the US, of course, or many places where you have to pay, you know, fifty, hundred thousand dollars for mm. uh, that would be expensive and maybe not very smart to, you know, you can't be very good at, you know, two things at the same time. And um, and that was uh, I wanted to really get deeper into the computer science. I I never became a really good developer. I always had really hard time with the, with the C, uh, like a low level languages. Uh, even the math, we went very deep. I wasn't very great at it ever, but um, I, I felt I was more, I was better at the kind of the, the business side, like understanding complicated uh, things and understanding, you know, kind of the people dynamic. And I'm, I'm a very people type of person, so I, I like that better as a as a, as I studied. But what happened to me in the school is that. I, I went to this new town, you know, moved there. Um, in the first few weeks, I, I you know, stumbled upon this girl who later became my, my wife. And uh, that was like within the first two weeks. And then I also kind of stumbled upon my, my roommates that, you know, we had this, well, not really like a roommate, but we had a house that we, we mm -hmm. shared together, housemates. And um, these two guys, they, they started the startup uh, in the first weeks of the school. So I, I kind of, decided to, you know, join them. They asked me, like, do you want to be part of this? I'm like, of course. And I, I became the first employee, more or less, in there. So 
you you kind of start you end up in working in a company in a startup and then you you know you get end up finding you know your spouse uh, in the first week so it's pretty busy you know first couple of years in the school and it was really fun to be able to work in the startup while you were studying two degrees so i mean maybe the busiest time of my life right so you know you, you're very lucky and i suppose also the military service would have taught you some uh maybe did it introduce you to these sort of adventure sports that you do to still do today because you do some really cool stuff don't you so um you uh so tell us just a little bit about the hobby side, give insight. Was and was the army because the, you are close to the Arctic Circle. In fact, Finland is in the Arctic Circle part of it, isn't it? So, were you, were you sort of get, was doing the military like um, Hunger Games, adventure games that you taught? <laughs> well, I mean, I I I I played hockey since I was I think four years old. And yep. you know, Finland hockey is like a, like a football in America or you know rugby in some other countries. So it's the only sport people really think highly. And um, I was I was pretty good. I mean, I played you know over a decade and you know started to practice twice a day type of stuff. So I was I was very you know active and you know I think I was pretty athletic when I when I went to army. So I mean, I was I was pretty fast. I was pretty strong, and you yep. know like a lot better than you know ninety nine percent of the class. So I I ended up work uh, going to army in 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 Lapland, in in Finland, like you know actually north of Arctic Circle, uh, yes. where you have no sunlight in the in the winter, and when you have twenty four seven sunlight in the summer. And I mean I don't I think we spend uh, maybe a bit, bit less than a hundred days in the in the nature, sleeping outside, you know like like surviving there. And uh, and you know fin Finland has a very simple military. You know, we don't really need to worry about the Swedish people, the Norwegians too much. So we are really kind of directing on the Russians that are, um, we have we have thousand miles of, you know, border. You there. Do. So it's like pretty easy to understand why we are there, what we're trying to do. And, um, and, and I was more like, you know, a bit like a guerrilla type of force where, you know, you go to the forest and, you know, you survive and you, 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 you kill people. But of course, we didn't kill anyone, but, you know, it was like, <laughs> that's the point. So, I mean, yeah, it, it was, it was kind of interesting to me and I love the nature and, you know, no, it was interesting to to be in in the middle of winter outside, and literally like minus thirty uh, mm. Celsius weather, sleeping outside, and you know snow caves and stuff. So I mean, I I loved it. I mean, that's kind of my kind of stuff. And yeah. uh, later, I've been doing a lot of adventure, you know, sports and and, and things, and um, and uh, climb a lot of rocks around the world, for example, and, and mountains. So i think that was the beginning and but i had already been hiking a lot with my 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 father he's a very active outdoors man he's a big fisherman so that's the world I, and i live in a small town i'm from like a ten thousand people village where we basically have you know we have the ocean we also have have you know a lot of forest so that was my my type of living mm. yeah i was reflecting on it because we had a chat before and uh said you know Basically, you had to do military service. I do. I've been to Finland a couple of times. Love the country. Love the people. Helsinki. I've been to the archipelago. I have been in minus twenty in Scandinavia, but not in Finland. And I know how cold it gets. But to sleep outside and be, you know, where it's dark, basically a hundred days of the year would be uh, would toughen you up. So, a bit like boys' own adventure, really. So it's um, and at, at the age when you're a young guy, that's the sort of you know stuff you really love to do. So, fast forward, you do uni. And uh, the gaming thing is still still around, isn't it? Tell us a bit about a um, quick thumbnail sketch of how you got to being the tech and then how you then got into the health industry. Because I think it's interesting. There's a personal family story there, and uh, which is really inspirational. So tell us a bit about, because you continued to dabble and, and actually be quite significantly in the gaming industry. Tell us how that, that all happened after university. Yes, yeah, so I, I was I studied and um, and I worked in this startup and I I really fell in love with the whole idea of, you know, building the early websites. We did a lot of websites for big companies, public companies. First time they had an online presence. So nobody knew anything about it then. This was early, you know, 99, 2000, 2001. And um, it was all new. And, you know, we were kids who knew nothing, but, you know, nobody else knew anything more. And, you know, mm -hmm. some of the senior executives, they hired us to do stuff because they knew even le less. And we, we looked credible because we smelled bad and, you know, we were very geeky. <laughs> so that was kind of the, the world. You've been, we, you've been we out looked, in the forest, We looked right? the ball in a way. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I think we were we were sitting in a dark room and you know trying to do stuff at go and whatever. <laughs> but uh, I I wanted to go abroad because Finland um, it, it's so different. Uh, we are now living you know 2024 and world is a lot smaller than it was 2000 because 2000 we kind of first time got online, we first time connected, yep. and we often forget how different the world is today than it was only 25 mm -hmm. years ago. And that time, you know, when you were in Finland, I was one of the first people to go study uh, in a university in the U.S., for example. I did one semester, and uh, it was really kind of interesting to go into. I was in Kansas, a uh, very different, you know, environment, but, you know, it was a good eye-opening. And it was hard to get. We had to kind of negotiate that place ourselves because nobody had these programs. Now you can go to the same university I went to, and you can get to Berkeley or Stanford. I mean, that's very different than it yeah. was before. So I wanted to go abroad. And um, I joined, uh, before I got to the tech, I joined a company called BAT, British American Tobacco. Um, it's one of the big tobacco companies. And, and they had this trainee program that they, they basically took people under their wing. And you could go four countries, two years, and, and learn the ropes. So I went to London. I went to you know, Lausanne in, in Switzerland and had, to, had a chance to work in, in Europe, around, around uh, Europe in multiple places. For two years and then i i stationed, stationed in in helsinki and stockholm and, and you know the northern europe and yep. i was running one brand lucky strike for them and and that was like i mean my learning to to become a you know business person like we had a, you know a lot of money and and we were running complicated things and i got a lot of responsibility right out of school basically mm -hmm. and having you know tens of millions of budget having a lot of people uh to manage uh that was a good learning round and you know we can debate about Tobacco, or whatever. I mean, not, not very sensible thing to do, but it was a really good learning ground. And and after that, I I had built a pretty good you know understanding what it means to to build business, to to build you know brands, to to market things. And and then I was headhunted from there to to Nokia, to to work in the in the gaming unit for Nokia. And the, the team I joined first was the the team at Nokia who built the first smartphone. I think the N N95 is the first Nokia device that, you know, was able to do video, uh, yep. images, uh, web browsing, email. And this was, you know, a few years before iPhone came out. So really the device that uh, kind of paved the way for, for this new era. And, and that device, I mean, it ended up selling something like 9 million units in the first year. I mean, 9 million doesn't sound a lot today, but this was the first smartphone that sold a lot. And, you know, it was so selling for a thousand bucks. So, I mean, it's, it's 9 billion revenue on a one device, never heard before in any almost consumer electronics. So maybe the most popular, best launch of a new product that, you know, almost had ever happened. And, you know, to be part of that little bit, I mean, it was really exciting. And then, of course, what we were doing then a few years, six years after that, I was building games. We were building new games for mobile devices. And now, of course, you know, we all, we all have phones and we all play games. And, you know, 5 billion people today play games on phones. Mm. That was not the case. You know, we literally have nobody. And, you know, I was sitting in a, in a Nokia head office and I saw this guy who, who built the snake. The snake, the first game that, you know, everybody played on mobile. Yeah. I mean, this guy did it and he started this thing that, because we often forget, again, 20 years ago, world was a different place. Mm. And mobile gaming, I was speaking here in San Francisco. There's an event called Game Developer Conference. I was speaking there something like 18 years ago. First time ever they had a mobile gaming uh, part of the conference. This is a big conference, 40,000 people, 50,000 people. We had 200 people in a room. These are the 200 people who actually make made mobile games 20 years ago. 200 people. Today, mobile games are bigger than music, movies, and books combined. Wow. That's just how much has happened in a short time frame. Mm -hmm. Mobile games are double the size of any other gaming. Like console games are small compared to mobile games. So... It was really exciting to be able to be part of something that started and to be there in the very first day. And that to me was the, the epiphany that, I mean, I've been trying to bottle up ever since. Like I want, I want to be in these rooms of people where mm -hmm. something new happens. And I've been able to now do it a few times. And nothing is as exciting to be in a room where you have 100 people who are talking about something new. And then you see a few years later that that same room is actually 10,000 people. Mm -hmm. And then it just balance up there. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that was a really important moment for me to be able to part of that Nokia story. And, you know, we failed. We failed to, you know, iPhone game, Android game, and they ate our lunch. 
Nokia was when I joined the most valuable company on the planet. And when I left, Nokia was valued something like 10th of that, if even that. So we failed. Uh, but you learn a lot when you are there, finding, fighting in the very beginning and trying to do the right things. And of course, it's not only because of me if we failed, but there are many other people to blame. <laughs> yeah, it is very exciting to be involved at uh, the start of a new industry. And uh, and I've experienced that multiple times as well. Number, you know, Firstly, I worked for one of the first IBM PC dealerships in sales and marketing in in Sydney, Australia. And it was just... It was the wild west of computing. That's when it all started. And uh, then I got involved in consulting with internet came out in the browser, which I was very excited about as well. And then social media turned up. So, and that, you know, I got involved in 2009 and that. And I remember when Twitter was small and getting online at night, and I could watch America wake up on Twitter from Sydney, Australia, and have conversations with people that were so excited about social media and what it could do for the world. And for me, that was one of the first time to said, I'm a citizen of the world now, not just of Australia. It, it really felt like we belong to a tribe of humans that were all trying to change the world for good. Um, so enough about that. I think that I'm really intrigued about now is you had an event, a health event in the family that, then took you after the gaming, I think, took you it to your next, um, I suppose, industry sector and your own business and the business you've been involved in since then. Tell us about what happened and uh, what impact it had on you and how you, that has turned into what you do today with Elo. And I want to know more about Elo as well. I think we'll leap straight to that after you tell us a story because I'm, I'm curious something listeners need to know is that quite often big opportunities come out of problem and pain, uh, not out of comfort. And I think um, if you could share that story, that would be, um, that'd be great. Yeah, it's a quite a long, long story and, and a long time span. But you know, while we were dabbling, I was you know, working different things and, um, and uh, trying to, you know, learn as much as I can about the tech, the gaming, all these things. Uh, we had this other uh, threat happening with uh, with my my wife and she had um, uh, she was a young you know twenty something woman uh, in year two thousand she had a uh, had a sudden like health scare so out of nothing she found that she has a big tumor on her neck uh, thyroid and, um, and that was uh, you know we we realized it out of out of nothing and then you know we get to the hospital of course you know they have to do something fairly quickly and you know a week or two later. Her neck is opened up and they take uh, the, the tumor away. Uh, other thyroid is also going away with it. And, um, and you know, healthcare did what they do well. So they took the, you know, tumor away. There's nothing beyond that. You're going to be, you're healthy. Uh, but at the same time, she ended up into these hormonal imbalances, these unknown unknowns we don't know in healthcare. And uh, she was medicated uh, probably for life. And uh, the medication is a side effect that, you know, and, and the whole, hormonal as so that you can you can never have a family and uh, that wasn't like a big biggest deal you know when you are 20 something you know of course it sucked but you know then later we started to really think about it and it became a, a topic that we wanted to solve and mm -hmm. we spent almost 10 years on going deep into western medicine eastern medicine and and we were living in 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 europe and then we we moved to california and we had really good doctors we we spent time. We probably talked to fifty different doctors, and finally found somebody who was able to guide us into into diet that was like anti-inflammatory diet that's now used a lot for like ALS and and Hashimoto's different diseases that are these anti-inflammatory diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, it helped. I mean, her body was able to heal itself, and and then of course you are like, wow. I mean, like now we can kind of get her out of medication. We can. And start to have a family and of course that it wasn't easy we had some other issues you know i think my my sperm motility was pretty weak and you know with some compatible issues whatever so we had to go ivf and and you know that that helped and that worked and you know many years passed i mean this whole thing took over a decade and uh and we finally got pregnant we were so excited about it and and then uh, we got very like unlucky that our our first son then then died not, not related at all into into this story mm. so it was uh really tough i mean you kind of spend a lot of your time and um, and thinking uh into this area and then this happens so that was a kind of wake-up call i was you know thinking about you know leaving 
building Nokia at the same time. I was thinking about building a new company. Uh, my wife was thinking about maybe moving on from business. It was in, in, a, in a corporate side. And we decided to kind of really overhaul our life completely. So I decided not to continue and build the new gaming company. You know, many more friends then left and built mobile gaming companies. And many of them are now billionaires. So they're doing great. And I decided to go to healthcare and build something different. And we had had these issues. Like I became a massive believer in the idea that food can be medicine. And it was medicine for us. And, and today we have we have two healthy kids who are thriving and doing great. And, and that's because of the of the food that you know healed my wife in that. And of course, we also had to do IVF again. So we also are very thankful for that that you know opportunity. But uh, the other problem was that we I was a I was a European who came to the US, and um, I was flabbergasted by the problem and the challenge of finding the right doctor and mm -hmm. navigating the healthcare. And and you know we we just couldn't find the right care and and that's maybe one part why we why we lost our first son, and um, I wanted to build a company to do it better. So I started a company called Better Doctor. Uh, that was the the first company after my game stuff, and it was very hard. Like we had people who built games and you know these tech people coming together and trying to build a healthcare company. We made every mistake fifteen times over, and um, and luckily you know all the time it. It, it did actually work and, you know, it became a very different type of company uh, that we expected, but, you know, now it has a big impact. And I mean, I'm, I'm really proud about the fact that we, we ended up building something that is now helping. The goal of the company in the beginning was you always write down your mission statement, like we want to help a million people to find a doctor that they love. I don't know if people find a doctor they love, but at least finding a doctor is a good thing. And maybe a bit <laughs> flamboyant on the on the last sentence, but you know, on the last bit. Uh, but you know, today the, we have helped more than hundred million people, two hundred million people. I mean, wow. how cool is that? Mm. So my problem, my wife's problem, has now helped a lot of people out there. Nobody really remembers better the name anymore, but you know, we are one of these backbone pieces of the of the healthcare system that you know is the right data is coming from us, and you know, it's throughout the system. So anyway, super cool experience to build it and and really proud about that whole thing a lot of really great you know teammates that we had and i work with many of them today at elo and and elo is kind of I, I then i went to i did private equity ceo gig uh to just you know run a company to learn learn that ground but then i was able to kind of start again doing a new company ground up and and elo is really my my focus on how do we make uh, the right nutrition more accessible how do we help people because the bottom line is this Today in, in the U.S., things are pretty bleak. Most people don't know this, but uh, the life expectancy has been declining now for the last few years. We have yes. lost two years of life expectancy. And today, if I'm a, I'm a man in the U.S., my expectancy today roughly is to live to 75. If I'm a same age man in Japan, I'm looking 85. That's 10 more years. How much would you pay... To have ten more years in your life, I mean, it's a lot of a uh, lot of money, and I mean, who wouldn't like to live until eighty-five to hundred, even maybe more than hundred? So, I think really we need to fix this because most people are sick today in the U.S. because of the chronic conditions that are born because of bad diet, lack of activity, and then also of course stress and and lack of sleep. We have to fix that, and we can fix it, and and that's what we try to do at Ella. Focus on that nutrition piece, and the simple statement again, like we had for the doctor finding, now we say we are trying to build a company that takes data from your body and turns that data with AI into tasty molecules that keep you healthy or heal you. Yes, yeah, so and you've got a novel approach to doing this because um, you've got an approach that uh, it's not about medication, but it's ha having lollies. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have nothing against medication. I'm a science driven kind of guy okay. every day. And yeah. I think there are wonderful medications. You know, medications help me to have a family, you know, heal my wife possibly. So nothing against that. I'm not like a like a woo woo kind of guy who says that okay. let's let's have you know cologne colognes and you know let's do that and then oh have choosing and not have cancer treatment. That will only end end up you being dead. But I think we have to pair nutrition, pair healthier habits together with the great medicine we have today. Yeah. So Tell us about how your approach is. I think um, from everywhere we had a chat before, your approach is very much data-driven about gathering data about a person because you create personalised gummies for people to take. 
Now, in the US currently, a lot of gummies are taken now, not just for lollies, but actually for marijuana. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, so one thing we one thing we decided to do in the beginning was this idea that what can we do? What, what we like? There's three principles that we 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 need to be through in order to build what we want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so we 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 had this very ambitious goal. Let's build this new concept called smart nutrition. You know, I was there in the beginning when we built the first smartphone. Well, we called it mobile computer, but who cares? Anyway, smart devices are personalized to you. Like think about the phone. It's the most personal device. It has all your photos, all your contacts. You buy a new phone, it's like an empty vessel. And then you you populate that with all your content, your apps, your things. It's really personal. It's also very precise. It's really based on the latest science and and you know it's it's the highest piece of tech. You know, in your iPhone you have more stuff than you have in a in a space shuttle. Way more. It's more, way more technical. And lastly, these devices that are smart are proactive. They are getting better over time. Like the more you use them, the better they get. I mean, they get maybe more addictive as well, but you know, they get better. So idea was what what if you could build the same thing for nutrition? What if your food, your nutrition could be similar? It could be personalized to you. It could be precise, grounded in real science, real data, and it could get better over time, maybe even tastier, you know, better outcomes. And to make that happen, you need three facts. You need to have ability to collect data from our bodies. So, you know, we have all these wearable devices today, like Apple Watch and Aura and, you know, Whoop and, and many other ones. Yeah, that well, is really well, well, powerful. Well, I'm wearing a Garmin that measures, you know, a lot of data. It's, it's amazing, you know. Um, and, and we are like think about it, we are still in the 1.0 of this just so look ahead like let's leap again 10 years ahead i talked about a bit like what what was the life like 2000 i mean we might forget but 2000 life was very different okay let's go to year you know 2035 mm -hmm. we're gonna have an apple watch or whatever we're gonna call it garmin or whatever it calls then yeah. that device yeah. will be able to look at you and tell you your glucose numbers it will tell your blood pressure it will give likely your blood biomarkers like your cholesterol and others in real time every day. Mm. So anything you put in your mouth, anything you do, you will get immediate feedback loop. And you're going to see if that is good for you or bad for you. That is something we can now do for like sleep. We can do it for maybe your you know, heart rate. Maybe we can do it for your glucose if you have a glucose monitor. But that is, we are in the beginning of it, 1.0. But once we get to the 3.0, everything will be in a wrist. Device costs less than 1000 bucks. can do all of the stuff in real time. It can connect to your doctor. It can connect to the AI that will guide you to the right thing. So I'm believing that that will be the case. So we also need to have ability to collect the, the blood biomarkers, like your DNA and all these things. And that's becoming more prevalent every day. Mm -hmm. And the last thing we needed to, to build LO, we need to be able to deliver build the products that are personalized, and then deliver them to your home. Today, we do supplements. That was the beginning we started from. We do pills, powders, and gummies. But of course, we also do meals and you know groceries uh, once we once we go forward. Yeah. In LO. But the idea is, like, what if you could have the right things around you so you do, do better decisions in your life? What if yeah. you make it easier so you don't need to really... You know, do this decisions like I'm. I don't eat eat many meat anymore, or I don't. I, I I don't eat this anymore. It's very difficult to make that decision because you know we we all love to eat certain certain stuff. Yeah. What if you could eat the same stuff, but it's just better for you? I mean, that is the unlock. I think we have to do. And I I always talk to everybody. I when we when I invest in a company, I I'm in a you know board of a company. We need to look at this. Like people often forget that Tesla, for example, it's it's not a it's not just a better electric car. It's a better car. It is a really good product. I mean, people are buying it not because it's electric, because it's a better car. You mm. know, it can drive itself. That's kind of cool. But, you know, it's just a really fun to drive. It's pretty affordable now when the price went down. And it's also just a really good pro product. Mm. iPhone is unbelievable product. Like, I mean, Android has been trying to do Samsung and others, Android devices. And, you know, you go from iPhone to Android, you're like, oh, my God. Like, what is this? And many people who go from Android, I mean, there are a lot of people who love Android. No, no, nothing wrong with that. I mean, there's this dogma people have often. But if you go from Android to iPhone and you learn to use it, it's just better. But now we are getting into an era where somebody will build a new phone within the next three years 
that will be AI driven phone. It might be ambient. It knows what you need. You open the phone, it will know what you want to do. I mean, that will be happening and that will be, again, a way better product than iPhone today. So somebody will leave frog. But to me, it's always like, let's build products that are so good that we feel that they become integral part of our life. Mm. Because it's people have tried to do this a long time. Like, you know, we built healthy food. Healthy food that tastes like shit. I mean, like, that's not going to work. I mean, it has to taste better than the whole food. That's how Tesla got going. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, it's really interesting. I remember my partner woke up one morning and she said, oh, I'm so in love. And I thought she was talking about me. But in her hand, she had her first <laughs> Apple iPhone. <laughs> and I went, all right, okay. I, I know what's number one here. Anyway, it, but the other thing I like, and I've talked about it recently, and it's something I'm really intrigued by, is what I call functional, beautiful design. In other words, it not only functions well, but it looks beautiful, the way it holds, you know, the way it looks, the way it works. Because um, I love modern contemporary art. I've just been to the Mona here in New York where we're recording this. And I walked into the MoMA, um, you know, design shop, and it's just full of incredibly beautiful designs that have incredibly fantastic function. And I, I think we're moving to an area, and Steve Jobs was incredibly um, obsessed by beautiful design that not only looked great, but actually performed fantastic as well. So I want to know, just quickly, here's a thumb sketch, like how you create personalised um, additives slash gummy bears for each individual person, because that's what you do. I, the story told me about how you went and sourced a person or a company in England to actually build your gummy bears that are personalized for you. Tell us about that process and how the program works. Yeah, I try to be very um, focused. Like when if I build something, I think the thing you built, it should be worthy to exist. I mean, there is a lot of beauty in the world. And, mm. you know, you go to the, to the MoMA, for example, um, you know, Eames has yes. built furniture. You know, this is 70 years ago. I still have, you know, half the stuff we have it at home is Eames. And, I mean, they are beautiful, but they're also very comfortable. Yes. And there was something unique about that era in, in 50s, the, the era of, you know, the modernism that happened. A lot of the great ideas were, a lot of the great designs were built there. And, of course, now you have, of course, Apple, is is maybe the epiphany of, of today, like the two thousands, like building products that are are beautiful, functional, just like part of your life. And mm. every time I, I build something now myself, I want to be very purist in a way. Like I want to, I don't want to go back in time. I want to go in the future. And mm. I'm thinking like, what could a thing be if we build it today? And I try to like you know make them make them to be real. So mm. I think we really had fun time in the last few years at Elo to build, I think, the flagship product today that we call the smart gummies. So the idea started from the point that, you know, we can do a blood test. Uh, we can collect data from your wearable devices. We can collect an assessment. So we have a lot of data about you. Then we use AI to understand what is what you need uh, from a nutrition perspective. And, and then the idea was like, what if we can cover many of the things that you get today in the supplement pills or powders? What if you can put that in one gummy and then delivered you. That was the idea. And I went around the world to, to search for companies who can make this. And we found one company who was able to create this product. And then we work with them for you know, a year or two now to get it out. And this is the outcome. So basically, this is my, uh, my gummy that I, I have today. It's seven layers. It has seven pills in one gummy. You can pick your flavor out of the eight different flavors. It tastes great. It looks beautiful. And basically, this is the same as I take you know, normally a handful of pills. And, you know, what is better? Having, you know, good taste in gummy vitamin, that's like candy. By the way, sugar-free vegan. Okay. And, I mean, it's just good. Mm. And, you know, I wanted to build an experience that's like not twice better, but 10 times better than today. But you mm. go to most homes, you open people's cabinets, they have 10 pill bottles. Now they get one wrapped gummy that has their name on the on the package thing. And they can take it to go. You go travel, you can pick five of them to go. I'm gonna go to London tomorrow. I'm gonna get, pick six to go and I get, take my gummies and I'm good to go. Mm. So it's just a much better product. And then 
every month, every quarter, we reformulate that. So this gummy is 3D printed out of 389 million combinations. So basically, we can sell this to half to America, and nobody will have the same gummy. That's pretty cool, right? That's very so cool. That's it's what like I love future. about that. Yep. And, and to me, that's like, the like how do you build things that are exciting in a way that you, you hear a story, you're like, I'm going to have to try it. And then you have built something worthy. And of yep. course, now we've been testing this out. We did, you know, the first test ever done where we tested people who took uh, the gummy with vitamin D. They took a, a pill with vitamin D. We tested those people at the beginning and then 90 days after. And we saw that the gummy people were able to improve the vitamin D levels in the blood more than the people with the pills because mm -hmm. the gummy people were taking it every day and the pill people were taking it maybe every day and missing here and there. Mm. Because the gummy is better product, it's more a part of your life. You can ink, add it into your life and you feel good about it. And mm. every time you do it, you feel something. You, it's like a treat that does something good for you. Mm. So that's what I'm thinking. Like when, we, when we're trying to build a better system for nutrition, for example, it has to be that way. Like I don't, I don't know how the ill or food or the meals will look like, but what if you can pull something together like this? Like you get the meal that is like absolutely great for you. Uh, I don't know how to do it yet, but I'm I'm thinking about it. Well, maybe 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 you could do it. Um, I'm intrigued. But number one, the question I have: you did mention blood tests, but I don't think you do it anymore. How do you get the personalized data to actually create the gummy for each individual? Yeah, so I have my blood test here. I mean, I, I just need to, I got the I do myself every quarter yellow test. Uh, you don't have to. So we started in a way that you had to do the test in the beginning, and then we paired up here with the codes, and mm -hmm. then you got the the pills. And, you know, some people love that. But many people are like, oh, I want to get the product sooner. It's too clunky. And, you know, I'm afraid to prick my finger. I haven't done it before. It's a lot of confusion. And when we grow bigger, you know, more and more people are less uh, adventurous like maybe I am. So for normal people, they were like, I want to I want to do an assessment. I wanna, I'm happy to answer, you know, 20 questions and I get the right product. So what did we do? We, we were testing people, thousands of people with the blood. And then we, they did an assessment. So we were able to kind of look at that data and build a predictive model with AI. And now we can predict what you need. I mean, we won't be 100% perfect. We, we don't know exactly your cholesterol value. We won't know your D vitamin value is 15 or 60. But we, we can predict and we can give you 80% the right product. Today, like I said, you're going to have a, a cabinet full of pill bottles that half of them are ex expired already. <laughs> That's not the right way to do it. You know, most people have no idea what they're taking. At least we can get very, very close to the optimal. And if you want, you can go to Elo app, click one button, you get the kit in two days, and then you get the real results. And they impact automatically your next shipment. So it's a pretty cool, I think, way we have now architected this. Yeah, it is very cool. Um, so the other question I hadn't asked before is, I, I'm from Sydney, Australia. And uh, so you don't currently offer it in Australia, I believe. Uh, only in the USA, is that correct? Yeah, only the US because yeah. the, the challenge with uh, with these products is that uh, uh, every country has their own regulatory landscape and um, it's not that difficult maybe for, for nutrition, food and, and supplements, but it's very difficult for, for testing blood. I mean, you can't send blood across the borders. That's very, very difficult to do. So I'm in New York. Could I Could I get a kit sent to me at my hotel and get it done and send it to you? Yeah, totally. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. And how long till I get the gummies? Could the gummies be sent to Australia? Though? Uh, I, I, we can all send to US. I mean, we, we again, <laughs> Australia is very far away. So I think, I think you know, our, our logistic part would be surprised if I'm if I'm sent to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Look, it's um, what you're doing is amazing, Ari. I'm just I'm blown away, and I think uh, I love your creativity and innovation. And I, I love your future leaning. And the other thing that um, I rather like is the beauty in the design, even for a gummy. I think it's really cool. And uh, yeah, it's I constantly amazed by you know gifted entrepreneurs such as yourself, amazing human beings that are changing the world one gummy at a time. And uh, that is so cool. So. Ari, uh, are there any tips for wannabe entrepreneurs, existing entrepreneurs, or people who want to start a business in this 
digital and AI leaning world that we are living in today, what would be some of your top tips to other entrepreneurs? Um, I have, this is the sixth time now I'm building something from ground up. And um, I've been very lucky to be able to do it in four or five different fields. So every time I start a new thing, I'm I'm a beginner and I have the beginner's mind. And of mm -hmm. course, once you deep dive into nutrition, for example, you will likely end up uh, you know, losing that beginner's mind. But in the beginning, it's very, very valuable. So mm -hmm. I think the what I tell a lot of people, uh, and it's so cool now to be a founder and, a, and an entrepreneur. I mean, and I mean it's fun. I mean, I I don't I don't I love this. I mean, I've been doing this for a long time, uh, over twenty years, and you know, being now a CEO founder for the last you know thirteen. I mean, I couldn't. I don't know if I can do anything else, and uh, I, I'm getting quite good at it. But uh, many people, they look at the kind of glamour, and you know, you can make a lot of money and you can get a lot of fame. But most people, it is a lot of grind. And it's very difficult to succeed. You know, we always talk about the few that made it, but there are many, 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 many more who didn't. So I think the number one thing, if you think about uh, to build a company, you can build a company, you know, my wife has a company and, and she's not raising any funding for it. She's running a good business, making money. That's fine. Like a lot of people, that's like, you know, being an entrepreneur in that sense is fine. But if you want to go to the VC game and raise funding and, and all that, you need to have an idea that you are committed for a decade. Like the better doctor for me took six and a half years. Plus then, then I was working in another company in the same field for two more. So almost 10 years. You need to be committed for 10 years. So look in the mirror and ask yourself like, okay, I have an idea. Uh, I want to do another game or app or whatever. Do I want to work on this 10 more years or 10 years? Mm -hmm. If not, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. And then that's why I think for me, I mean, I try to, find meaning in my past life to give me the energy to go through the hard times when they always come. And today we are living in a very difficult time, for example. A lot of people are not getting funding today. I'm in a healthcare where a lot of you know companies are underperforming in a public market. So not, not the easiest times. And we are kind of this pseudo recession unknown time today. So it's not easy. So that's one thing. Like pick a pick a topic that you know on area that you really care about enough. And then the second one is that, you know, do you want to do it alone or do you want to go with somebody else? Um, if you're going to partner with somebody, you know, you better date with that person a little bit. Don't pick the random guy and, and start a company <laughs> because it, it will be a disaster in most cases. And like I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very, very fortunate in a way that I, I started uh, to work together very closely at, at Nokia with my, my co-founder, Tapio. Mm -hmm. I have two founders, in, in, uh, two co -founders uh, on this um, but Tapio, you know, I met 17 years ago and since then we've been working every day together. There's a fourth company for us together. Wow. And, um, that's pretty unique because, you know, I can, I trust him hundred percent and, you know, he's hundred percent better than I am in all the things he does. I'm probably better what I do and we can divvy up tasks. And it's been so fun to work with somebody that, you know, is there on a, on a hard days for you and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So that is really making much more fun. And, you know, some people start a company alone, a startup and raise them up. That's hard. Uh, because then they're very lonely. And and then the third point, I think, on, on this is that uh, um, if you want to do impact, like my goal is to, to have impact. And uh, yes, I mean, I had maybe some impact on the on the doctor stuff I built uh, all 10 years. I mean, I'm proud about it. But, you know, still, if I want to do have an impact, I have now friends. I'm 45. I have many friends, you know, who, you know, went to good schools and they they done a really good, you know, career in big companies. And now they're starting to be, you know, at the sea level. And I think they have much more impact than I have. I might, may never have that impact because I can build these startups, but, you know, even if I make them pretty big, I still have, you know, millions of people. Mm. And my friends are working companies like Google and they have an impact on billion people today, every day. Yeah. So in a sense, if you really want to impact the world, it might be easier almost to do in a bigger company. And people often say like, why would you go to work in a big company? I mean, one reason is that, you know, you could be there if you do the right things and you get, you know, high enough, you know, you can really have a massive impact. Mm. And uh, and that's something that people often forget. Uh, mm. There are not many people that I know, and I've been playing the startup game now for a long time. And I mean, in Silicon Valley, I mean, I know a lot of people here. I'm probably connected to thousand CEOs. Mm. Out of them, I think five people have made real impact. Mm. Many of them made a lot of money, no question about that. But I don't think it's about the money. I think it's about 
can you have an impact in the world around you? Mm. Yeah, I remember the quote um, when Steve Jobs hired John Scully. He said, do you want to keep selling sugar drinks or do you want to change the world? And uh, I remember that quote. And uh, so I, I love your takeaways and tips. Number one is uh, have something that's purpose-driven. Uh, number two, pick the right partner to work with and because you're going to have to be spending every day with them, maybe more time than you're going to spend with your wife or your partner. Number three, and also the other part of that too was, you know, play the long game. And number three is impact. Um, but, you know, you are making an impact, definitely, and in, you already have. So I don't think underestimate yourself. Um, I think you've done a... I'm, I'm blown away by your creativity and innovation, as I said before. So, Ari, thank you very much for sharing. And one final uh, thing I want to ask is, um, and I think I know the answer already is, what brings you deep joy and you would do it even if you weren't getting paid? <laughs> I, I love building stuff. Um, I played Legos, you know, as a kid. And when I was not playing with computers, I see my son playing Legos and building amazing things today at age nine. And uh, I think the building is is the is the one thing that, you know, it just keeps me excited and, and, you know, seeing and maybe being in a tiny way involved in inventing the, the future mm. uh i mean we are living in the most exciting time i think we are ever because we have a few things happening that are unbelievable mm. ai today i think is a catalyst that uh, will have an impact beyond our imagination i mean i tell a lot of people today that it is fire wheel industry ai mm. internet all these things are just stuff i think ai is the same catalyst as like fire and uh, it will be unbelievable because we are many people don't talk about this we all use the llms we don't understand today what happens when you connect the llms today the large language models into robots that are getting better by the day mm. that will be like just a few years from now mm. two three four five years from now you're going to be walking in the store and there are going to be like 10 robots picking up food, mm. bringing them home, cooking the meals, mm. you know, gardening your, your lawn, cultivating food in your backyard, cooking the mission star food at your home, taking care of the elderly people. That's happening in a moment. Mm. And I've seen some of the robots that are now coming up that are connected to the LLMs. And you can go and look online, uh, some videos. Yeah. It is absolutely unbelievable. They're better than the, the Terminators. Yeah. Yeah, I, I really, I totally believe with you that uh, AI is the new fire, um, and it fascinates me. And I'm intrigued by leaning to the future where the intersection of AI and humanity, where they maybe blend, maybe they become a separate species. We don't know, and that leads us to things like questions such as, if AI and robots can do all the heavy lifting, what will humans do? That will still be purpose driven. Will we become just, will we lean more into beauty for its beauty's sake? And will we lean more into, um, you know, about interestingness? And I'm actually this Friday, I'm interviewing Nick Bostrom from uh, Oxford University, who wrote Super Intelligence and uh, released a new book called Deep Utopia. And uh, he's got some fascinating insights. So I'm looking forward to that chat, but I totally agree with you. I think we are, uh, we are, we are at the wild west and just the start of AI and um, but still we're going to work out how what will we be as humans with AI plugged into us or part of us invisible and visible um, I'm intrigued and curious so Ari thank you very much for sharing um, your journey and experience it's been an absolute joy for me to listen to you and hear your stories um and i think when i'll sum up what i think i heard when you talked about what brings you joy and you do it even if you weren't paid and that is to create things in other words i think that as humans is what we truly are is creators and innovators and uh, you are one of those and we all one of those some just do it in different ways so thank you very much for sharing it's been an absolute blast mate thank you